an architect's draft etched across the sky of Normandy. Le Havre is open to the ocean breezes carrying seagulls and to the waves that sing on the pebble beaches. Le Havre, gateway to the ocean. For centuries now, boats have sailed past the jetties and out of the port, their prows reaching for the horizon, off to conquer the world. Le Havre is a port city founded at the beginning of the 16th century, in 1517 to be exact, by François I. The king wanted a city on the Seine estuary to open the Kingdom of France to the New World, for that was the time of the great discoveries. And Le Havre was to be that ocean port, open out onto the world and in particular onto America, which had just recently been discovered. Although Le Havre cannot be compared to Rotterdam, Antwerp or Hamburg, it is still one of Europe's foremost ports. But the time when the city was home port to the ocean liners bound for the Antilles, North and South America, is now long gone. The Normandy, the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mary. Until the advent of commercial aviation in the 1960s, these sumptuous rapid liners assured passage to New York, making La Havre part of the transatlantic travel legend. The bright, airy city we see today has nothing in common with the town that once welcomed those great ocean liners. With its strategic position, La Havre was occupied by the Germans during the Second World War and bombed in June 1944. In the deluge of fire and steel that rained down upon the city, 10,000 buildings were destroyed, another 10,000 damaged. Le Havre won the unenviable title of the most destroyed city of France. Now you know that a lot of cities that were bombarded during the war were reconstructed afterwards. Saint-Malo, Cologne in Germany, Warsaw, of course. They chose to restore their history and reconstruct the cities just as they'd been before. De Gaulle took the opposite tack concerning Le Havre, reasoning that we would usher in a new era. He called on Auguste Perret, the most prestigious architect of that post-war period. Perret accepted the commission to design a new city right down to the architecture of each building. Perret was the first architect in the world to construct housing using reinforced concrete. By mixing the texture of concrete, colored and enriched with gravel and minerals, with ornamental features of classical architecture, such as columns, capitals, and porticos, Auguste Perret's long decried buildings entered into history. In 2005, Le Havre was declared a World Heritage Site. Those cities had any number of historical sites from the 17th and 18th century. Nevertheless, they were expecting the rich countries like France, the more modern countries like the United States, to show the way with good examples of 20th century architecture and urban planning. soft light of the setting sun, our boat slowly leaves the port. With Le Havre and the towering spire of St. Joseph's Church behind us, we head for the open sea. Let the cruise begin. Direction, England. During the 
night, we cross the English Channel. In the early morning, we make our way into the port of Dover, escorted by a tugboat. Thirty-five kilometers separate the cliffs of Dover from the French coast. As soon as you set foot in this town, you can feel that Dover makes an effort to maintain its difference a very British exoticism, surely a way of asserting that, in spite of the Channel Tunnel, England is still an island. Dover, the gateway to England, the very first place that Julius Caesar found when he arrived over 2,000 years ago. And one of the first things they did was to make a safe harbour here in Dover and they built a lighthouse, a pharos, up on the cliffs to navigate ships coming in from the sea. So in all those years of history, 2,000 years of history from the Romans right the way through to the Normans, 1,000 years ago, right the way through to World War II, been at the forefront of the nation's defense. The boat will remain docked in Dover all day, so without wasting any time, we decide to head for London. Big Ben and Westminster Palace are the inevitable starting points for a visit of London, but the largest tourist draw on any given day is the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. London likes contrasts. Respect for the monarchy and its traditions exists side by side with a certain sense of nonconformity. In this city constantly on the move, where the red buses vie with the black taxis for the roads, you can find the colors and the accents of all the nations of the former British Empire, starting with the Indo-Pakistani community. The Indian-Pakistani community is quite successful business people. My grandparents, they, my grandfather, he worked here, and, but he always went back home. I, I came here and I stayed. And London is a, such a beautiful city. I can't live without it more than a week. If I go for a holiday somewhere, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I miss my potholes on the road. This very pleasant trip on the Thames has allowed us to discover the historic heart of the city. One mustn't forget, however, that the sea is very close. Until the beginning of the 1950s, London was a very busy port, harboring ships from the four corners of the globe. Built at the end of the 19th century, Tower Bridge, one of the city's major symbols, is much more than a mere monument. The bridge that links the two neo-Gothic towers opens, allowing ships from the high seas to pass through. of the river here in London was throughout quite a long period of time. Back in the 16th century, boats would line up in the middle of the river, side by side, and smaller vessels would then 
rush towards them and offload their produce to be taken to the shoreside. Later on though, at the end of the 18th century, it was decided that there needed to be a better system than this, and that's when the docks were created. The goods coming to London came from all over the British Empire, all over the world, and they were offloaded into the buildings lining the riverfront. Around where we're standing here is where the spices were delivered. Close by to here on this side of the river was where timber was delivered into the Surrey docks. And on the other side of the river, you'd have had all manner of things from gunpowder to tobacco to wool. Everything that came to this country arrived first of all here in the port of London. Sailing along the old docks of London's port, we head towards Dover to get back to our boat. We have left England. We are sailing in a northeasterly direction towards the Netherlands and Amsterdam, our next port of call. boat has reduced its speed. Leaving the open sea, we sail slowly inland along the canal that links the North Sea to Amsterdam. Two hours later, we're Kayside in Amsterdam. City of prestigious art, a major commercial and maritime power, Amsterdam, unlike Venice, to which it is often compared because of its canals, has cultivated over the centuries a certain art of simplicity. This spirit is undoubtedly best seen today in the way of life of the city dwellers, who get around mostly on bicycles. In Amsterdam, everything has been done to make cyclists comfortable. In the downtown district, there is a lot of traffic on the bike paths. The pedestrians have to keep off those paths or else be very careful stepping onto them. This is especially true for the tourists who are not used to bike paths. This can sometimes give rise to dangerous situations. In Amsterdam, bicycles outnumber cars. The bicycle is very practical, whether for going to work, shopping, picking your children up at school. The bicycle is rapid, and it can go anywhere. Before becoming the bicycle city, Amsterdam was, and still is, a city of water.
in zekere zin uh, spelen de, de, de gevaren. Uh, Protection from foreign threats was not the only reason the city constructed these canals. De grachten moet je zien als een onderdeel van een stadsuitbreidingsplan. Stad die extreem goed. They were an integral part of the urban planning. Deze stad was er met een grote vestingwal waar niemand kon binnendringen en die aan één kant dus. And even in the Middle Ages, the city was already very well protected on the seaside by an enormous dike. Hoe kunnen we die stad even veilig no one could get past that. maken, want die was er natuurlijk nog in de 17e eeuw en tegelijkertijd heel leefbaar. Uh, werken die hier gedaan zijn, uh, dat zijn uh, stadspaleizen. When the city began to grow, it became not only a question of expanding the city, but also making it livable as well. Indrukwekkend. Taking into account that there was limited space. So the canals met these two criteria. We are a rather efficient people. We are not too concerned about appearance and decorum. And here in Amsterdam, more than any other city in Holland, the canals make up the veritable setting of the city. The stately townhouses are decorated with stone ornaments that sometimes look like wigs on top. In a way, that's the city's exuberant side. Die je elders in Nederland niet zult aantreffen. When the day is over. We're back sailing along the canal that links Amsterdam to the open sea. Next stop, Hamburg. Once again, we leave the high seas. Penetrating the wide estuary of the Elbe, we sail up this great river. Hamburg, one of the largest ports in the world, is more than 100 kilometers inland. Since its birth in the 9th century, the history of Hamburg has been inextricably linked with that of its port, which is unquestionably the city's most beautiful work. Away from the Kays, Hamburg is a mosaic of modern buildings with imposing silhouettes like the City Hall, built at the end of the 19th century in the Neo-Renaissance style. The 
The city's only architectural treasure is this 10-story brick building built by a ship owner who made his fortune from saltpeter in Chile. Hence the building's name, Chile House. It's a magnificent example of German expressionist architecture of the 1920s. In Hamburg, all roads lead to the port, whose history was influenced by the city's membership in the Hanseatic League, which it joined in 1321. At the beginning, the Hanseatic League was a guild, or Hansa, of a few merchants established in cities of northern Germany. Later, it became an association of cities. More than 100 cities were members. 80 were directly involved, even though no contract had ever been formally signed among them. The Hanseatic League had a good number of partners. It was one of the largest economic associations of the Middle Ages for the north of Europe, but also for the south. The League had commercial ties with cities in France, like Bordeaux, but also in Spain with Seville, for example, from which it imported olive oil. Originally, the Hanseatic League was an association of merchants between Lübeck and London. Since this association was profitable, Hamburg decided to join also and specialized in trading amber, wax, a valuable commodity at the time, cod, herring, and beer. You can really say that Hamburg was the brewery of the Middle Ages. The city of Einbeck was well known for its beer, but Hamburg boasted close to 400 breweries at a time when beer was really a staple food. Not one edifice from the Middle Ages remains. No matter, the port of Hamburg has survived the centuries and their trials, born anew from its ashes time and time again like a phoenix, ever stronger, ever bigger. Once night falls in Hamburg, the city struts its stuff. Feisty tattooed sailors, rusting freighters, kind-hearted prostitutes walking rain-wet sidewalks. Myths die hard. Those days are well and truly over. But as long as there are still tourists to believe in them, During the night, we leave Hamburg and head north for the Baltic Sea. A day at sea is in store for us, which, like all the other passengers on board, we spend at the leisurely pace of the cruise. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm John for Costa Officer and Crew. I have the honor and the pleasure to welcome you. I thank you for choosing Costa for your occasion with C. Prima Briti, si tutti insieme, Anne, Susan, Mentor, Sunto, Susan, Sombra, Susan, 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 Susan,
The next morning, we're approaching Copenhagen, capital of Denmark. of a symbol has nothing to do with its size. Copenhagen's Little Mermaid, a mere 125 centimeters, is as famous as the Statue of Liberty or the Eiffel Tower. The Nyun waterfront is one of the liveliest places in town. Restaurants and cafes occupy the colorfully painted townhouses, in front of which old wooden ships are docked. Nyun Arbor was dug at the end of the 17th century to allow ships access to the nearby Royal Square. Warehouses, townhouses for merchants, and later inns for sailors have given the Kays their present-day aspect. The entire history of Copenhagen, which means port of merchants, has been marked by maritime commerce since its founding in 1167. The city was founded after the Viking epoch, so they're not part of the city's history even if some traces of them have been found here. Maybe they traded here or landed on the beach. Later, the city grew and became the country's major port. When they began to establish colonies, like Gerda, for example, did in the East Indies, that, of course, had an influence on the city's development. Many of the docks and lovely buildings owe their existence to the wealth generated by trade with the East and West Indies, but also by the slave trade, in which the Danes were actively involved. Just a stone's throw away from the colored facades of Nyun, the octagonal Amalienborg place is attracting a crowd of sightseers. The changing of the guard takes place every day at noon when the queen is in residence. Churches, palaces, canals, parks, streets, lanes, caves, and harbors, down through the centuries, Copenhagen has continued to evolve. To demonstrate the city's lively, changing character, a wall of interactive images has been installed in the city center. Um. The wall is an installation that displays images of Copenhagen. The images come from the museum, but also from the public who transmit them directly to the wall via internet. 
The interesting thing is that out of the 10,000 images, 2,000 come from the inhabitants. They depict not only the present-day city, but they are also a testimony of the city of yesteryear. Many of these images come from family albums. Before continuing our own voyage, one last boat trip will take us to discover other parts of the city which seem to be floating on the water's surface. Copenhagen, a town where elegant vestiges from the past, like the KDM Dannebrog, the royal yacht launched in 1931, blend with new aesthetic innovations conceived by world-renowned architects. Under a magnificent sky torn asunder by the forces of light and darkness, we take to the seas again, heading north towards Norway. The sun is playing hide and seek with the clouds as we slowly head up the 100 kilometer long fjord that leads to Oslo. In 1048, the Viking Harald Sigurdsson, tired of traveling the world, sailed up this fjord and decided to found his kingdom's capital here, thus making Oslo the oldest Scandinavian capital. Until the 20th century, when the tenor of life in the country changed with the discovery of oil in the North Sea, the entire economy of Norway had been dependent on the sea. Taking their lead from the capital, Oslo, the Vikings established their early settlements in the shelter of the fjords. The lines of the Viking ships on exhibit at the Oslo Museum are so harmonious, so pure, so modern, that we might almost forget that they were built more than 1,000 years ago. Discovered at the end of the 19th century by farmers, these boats were used in funeral rites. Important members of the community were placed inside the boats, which were then buried under an earth tumulus.
Along with very simple household tools, certain other objects found in these boats display an unexpected refinement and inspiration, depicting strange creatures and sometimes rather spooky animals. In the 13th century, 200 years after it was founded by the Vikings, Oslo became the capital of the Kingdom of Norway. That is also the period when Akerhus, the massive fortress that overlooks the sea, was built. Over the following centuries, Norway was subject to both the commercial dictates of the Hanseatic League and to Danish political domination. Oslo, far from Stockholm and Copenhagen, the political and cultural centers of Scandinavia, developed slowly and sank into a sort of provincial slumber. It was not until Norway gained independence in 1905 that Oslo, which had been renamed Christiana by the Danish, took back its original name and its status as capital. While Norway struggled to emerge from its long centuries of economic and political dependence, Oslo became, in the beginning of the 20th century, a very active culture and artistic center. The artist who best incarnates this cultural blossoming is the painter Eduard Munch, the precursor of Expressionism. We're very proud of Munch. Edvard Munch lived at a time when there were many other well-known Norwegian artists. There were writers and the sculptor Gustav Wigland. Munch willed all his work to the city of Oslo. The city has taken very good care of his work, and they're on exhibit at Oslo's Munch Museum. We're planning to build a new building near the Oslo Fjord to house this museum, which is now situated in the city center. Nothing has been officially decided yet, but we're very proud of his paintings and we're hoping to show them off to their best advantage. Another important actor on the Norwegian artistic stage at the turn of the 19th century was the sculptor Gustav Vigland. In the Frogner Park, Vigland staged monumental statues. This 17-meter-high granite block sculpture of a hundred entangled figures is one of the most famous. A stone god, a bronze colossus, children and adults, Vigland's entire body of work is a hymn to life and human relationships. After the Viking treasures and the masterpieces of Munch and Vigland, the new Oslo opera, with its simple, clean lines resolutely turned towards the sea, symbolizes the creativity of a country that blends nature and modernity. We have once more weighed anchor. Oslo disappears slowly in the foamy wake our boat is leaving on the surface of the fjord's deep waters. We sail down the fjord's peaceful waters for quite a while. It's a last respite for the captain before facing the traffic of the North Sea.
queste zone sono particolarmente trafficate. The traffic is particularly heavy in this area of the sea. Over the years, the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, has set up regulations, separation and safety standards. And all the boats respect them, whether they're freighters, cruise ships or ferries, and all that makes it easier to regulate the traffic. This is our last day at sea. From now on, we'll be sailing west towards Edinburgh, the final stopover of our cruise. The coast of Scotland is in sight. We sail slowly eastwards through a labyrinth of rocky islets towards Leith, the port of the Scottish capital, Edinburgh. drop anchor a short distance from the coast. We arrive in Scotland aboard a small local boat, welcomed by the sound of bagpipes. Green hills, peaceful reminders of long past volcanic activity, attract crowds of walkers on Sundays. Originally in the 7th century, the strategic position on the coast road between England and Scotland made the volcanic mound of Castle Rock an ideal place to found the city of Edinburgh.
Originally, the power base of the Scottish kings was much further north, but gradually they began to move southwards and they settled on Edinburgh because it had everything. It had the perfect place for a castle, for a fortress, and it also had access to the trading routes. And the sea, as you, as you can see, is very, very close. So we were bringing in some wonderful products like the wine from Bordeaux, we were bringing in oranges from Spain, timber from Russia, all sorts of goods were flooding into Edinburgh and it helped to make Edinburgh quite a wealthy place actually. So if you wanted to buy something special, this was the place to come. The charming old Edinburgh, with its maze of little streets and alleyways twisting upwards towards the castle, is no longer home to a shady kind of society, where beggars live side by side with the wealthier classes, as in the Middle Ages. Today, it is a tourist area full of cafes, restaurants, and souvenir shops. <laughs> Angry one. Raise the sword, stand your ground! Okay, there you go. Thank you. Keep the image oh, I gave you. A royal residence, and then a military fortress, Edinburgh Castle was last used for military purposes during Bonnie Prince Charlie's Jacobite rebellion against the English crown in 1745. Now, it is the most popular tourist site in Scotland. Later on, during the 1700s, they decided to develop the land down here, the new town. And this was at the time when people were admiring the neoclassical style of living, these ancient civilizations of Rome and Greece. And this is what you'll see a lot of in Edinburgh, these beautiful classical buildings. The new town, a perfectly conserved example of neoclassical architecture, was, like the old town, declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1995. After Le Havre, London, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Hamburg, and Oslo, our voyage to the most beautiful capitals of Northern Europe ends in Edinburgh. And in the Scottish tradition, we finish to the sound of music.